this heart open wide from the depths from the heights i will bring a sacrifice with these hands lifted high hear my song hear my cry i will bring a sacrifice i will bring a sacrifice i lay me down i'm not my own i belong to you alone lay me down lay me down oh and on my heart this much is true there's no life apart Of my pride, giving up all my rights, take this life and let it shine, shine, shine. Take this life and let it shine. joy to say your will your way it will be my joy to say your will your way it will be my joy to say your will your way always it will be my joy to say your will your way it will be my joy to say your will your way it will be my joy to say your will your way always Good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to take this time to welcome you all uh, to yet another Calvary online service. Uh, we are so grateful that you are still tuning in, uh, especially with the schedule changes and the time change that happened really early this morning. Losing that hour is hurting already, I can tell. We'll get used to it, though. Uh, we are going to continue for a while to have our services here uploaded uh, and premiering at uh, about 4.30 p.m. each Sunday. Uh, so uh, keep coming back at 4.30 each week uh, for our service. 
Pastor Dwayne today will be taking us through James 4, 13 through 17, a great passage to remind us that even here as we make plans and have made plans and have seen things change so much in recent times uh, that we need to trust in God in our planning. Easter is fast approaching, April 4th, and God willing, we'll have two services in person. We'll have our first indoor service at 9 a.m., and since we usually see a spike in attendance on holidays, once we hit our 25% capacity in the sanctuary, folks will be redirected to some overflow seating where we'll have a live feed of the service screened in order to accommodate and welcome any and all who are led to our campus for Easter. The second service will follow shortly after, as usual, uh, on the lawn at 10.45 a.m., where we will be, uh, have plenty of room on the lawn to spread out and worship together. We are also having our Good Friday service a couple of days earlier on April 2nd at 7 p.m. That will be just the one service uh, in person uh, where we'll also have the Zoom feed overflow seating available if we hit that uh, 25% indoor capacity, as well as uh, we'll be sharing that uh, same Zoom webinar link that's being broadcast to the overflow to our Calvary Facebook page and our email list. So look out for that. And now it is time for another reminder for you all to check out the Church Center app. We are going to try and make more uh, use of those online services that Planning Center has put together um, for churches. And I hope you investigate and check those things out. If you have any questions about that, uh, you can email myself or Emily at our church emails. They'll be shown right here. And uh, we'll put those also in the description below. Or you can uh, email info at calvarylompoc.org for any other general questions or concerns you may have for us. We also want to keep Nate Marsh and his family in our prayers as we are looking so forward to his coming as our senior pastor. Uh, But there is still work to be done before that time comes. Nate sent out a great update email last week. Uh, Look for that if you have not seen it. It has a great picture of his house in the snow, and uh, he details out the stuff that's going on between now and their arrival near the end of May and beginning of June. Well, let's take a look uh, to Scripture, the book of Psalms, as we continue into the service. Uh, Hear these words from Psalm 33. Sing a new song of praise to him. Play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy. For the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust everything he does. The Lord frustrates the plans of the nations and thwarts all their schemes, but the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. Don't count on your war horse to give you victory. For all its strength, it cannot save you. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Let's worship together. Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my 
shall I fear of whom shall I Shall I fear of whom shall I be afraid? Cause you prepare a table in the presence of my foe. And you anoint my head And my cup it overflows And surely I will dwell In the house of the Lord In the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Daniel. Good morning, Calvary. Good morning. Oh, you are awake out there, huh? I figured that most of you would start waking up about an hour from now. But uh, we'll push through anyway. I'm not sure I'm awake either, but we'll try it. Well, this morning we want to turn to James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. And uh, we want to discuss, I guess, the topic of the Lord's will in our life. The Lord just being involved in our life all the time. And, and our plans and our actions, how how they must take the Lord into account so that we might walk where he wants us to walk and be what he wants us to be. In his poem, Invictus, William Henley wrote a very famous line that has been quoted so often. I thank whatever gods that be for my unconquerable soul. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I hope that none of you would ever dare with any kind of conviction and honestly, honesty say words like that. I trust that you would never challenge the Lord with such blasphemous statements as William Henley chose to write. But what if, not by the words of your mouth, but by your actions, you said the same things that he said in his poem? If God revealed to you that you were doing and living as though he did not exist or have any practical uh, influence in your life, would, would you stop yourself up short and, and turn and repent of those actions? Would, would our lives, if our lives, reflected the poem that I am the captain of my soul, I am the master of my fate, would you stop and recognize the error of your way and turn and trust Jesus? I trust that there are very few Christians who would say things like William Hendley wrote, but I'm afraid that there are too many Christians who act like it. We wouldn't dare say those words, but our lives and the things that we do reflect that really that's what we're thinking inside. Listen to what James says as he writes to some Christian businessmen who were living just like that. James 4, 13 and following. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, we'll spend a year there, we'll carry on business, and we'll make money. 
Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and does not do it, sins. People, God is with us. He is with us every single moment of every day. He is involved in every single act that we do. And so we must not live our lives as though he were not relevant or powerful or to the extreme, live our lives as though he did not exist. But these businessmen that James writes about, they were doing just that. Pride was closing their eyes to the reality and they could not see how ridiculous and dangerous they were living life. Well, they talked and made plans as if they were the master of their fate and the captain of their souls, that God did not exist, that God had no relevance to them. That's the way they were actually living. So James awakens them. He pulls them up short, and he talks about the futility of living a life of, we'll call it practical atheism. And he does so by reminding us of two particular things about life. The first one that I want to point out in verse 14 is he directs us to the brevity of life, how short life can be. Verse 14, you are a mist which appears for a short time, and thereafter it vanishes. These businessmen had decided that they were going to travel to a certain city, and they were going to work there for a year, and they were going to make a lot of money in their business. They had decided all that. They planned in such a way that they were confident of at least the lifespan of another year, for they were going to spend at least that much time there. They were confident that they could make money that they wanted. They were planning without considering the warning of Solomon in Proverbs 27.1 when he said, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day will bring forth. People, it's not planning that's wrong. We should all plan. We should all look to the future and try and figure out the best way to approach it. So that's not the problem here. No, it's not doing business that's condemned. We must do business. It's not making money that's condemned. Those three things are mentioned in this passage, but it's not those things that are wrong. It's not those that James speaks against. No, it's the manner of planning and the goal of their business that's said to be evil. They planned as if God were not there. They did business as if their earthly life was all that existed and they had the power to determine what their life would be like. They pretended that they could determine all of this stuff, that they had the power and the wisdom to do so. People love to enjoy their earthly life without interruption. And we give very, or they gave anyway, very little thought to the the wise providence of God. And the wise providence of God may have called their life shorter than what they planned. The providence of God may have resulted in them losing money instead of making money. But they gave no thought to God or his will or his wise providence. When we do not consider the transient nature of life, we lose an important incentive to living each day as though it were the last before being called into the presence of a glorious and wise judge of all men. When we lose sight today of the imminent second coming of our Lord, we lose a tremendous incentive to live a holy life every day and every moment. We should live life expecting that this might be the time when we'll come face to face with our God. And so we cannot afford to waste that time. We try to avoid thinking about James' statement 
Yet every time we celebrate a birthday, every time we attend a funeral, every illness that we suffer, every time that we sit down and try and plan for the future, it ought to be a reminder that God controls your life. That your life is just a vapor, a mist, and it's quickly gone, like the morning fog here. Well, sometimes it's not just a morning fog, but like the sun dissipates the fog sometime during the day. It was in a discourse about his second coming that Jesus, in Matthew 24, 38, said this, For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took, many, took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and carrying on like nothing was going to happen. And yet terrible judgment was going to come. And they didn't even realize it. They didn't consider what God was doing in their lives. They wouldn't listen to, to uh, Noah pre uh, preaching and telling them about the will of the Lord. Well, I haven't given up eating, nor have I given up drinking, and I'm still married. So those were not the problems. No, he wasn't railing against those things. The problem was that people were living as though there were no end to their life and God was not relevant. They were just doing what they wanted to do and that was it. And forgetting about God's providence, God's sovereign judgment in their lives. They were planning for a future that took no account the fact that God rules over all and determines all things. Listen to the parable that Christ told in Luke chapter 12, verse 16 and following. It says, he told them this parable. The ground of a certain man produced a good crop. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain for my goods. I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This will be how it is with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Too much of our world lives as though they determine what's going to happen. And they forget about taking God into account in the plans for their life and in the direction that they take all the time. Time after time, Scripture deals with the lifestyle that excludes God that expresses the thoughts of William Henry in, Henley in his poem. People live as though God didn't matter, that he just plain doesn't exist or doesn't have anything to do with us. Well, when my father died, my brother and I went to the cemetery after the funeral service, and there we stood with the, at the family plot and the gravestones told a story, a silent story as we read it. Warren, father, 84 years. Ellen, my mother, 72 years. Dolores, my sister, six years. And what seemed like just yesterday, we laughed and hugged and kissed and now their photographs silently tell us a story. Life is a vapor. It quickly passes. My dad lived a good long life, 84 years. That's good. My mother did too, 72. But my sister, six short years, and God called her home. You know, Scripture warns us 
that none of us will last long on this earth. And the scriptures say that we do not live until Jesus now. We will not live with him in eternity. Live your life fully cognizant of the fact that God is directing your ways, that God needs to be included in your plans, that you need to seek out his will in your life as you make those plans and as you go along. Because if you leave God out of your plans and live as though this life will never end, you become a practical atheist. And James would call us up short and say, Consider God in every aspect of your plan. Consider God every day of your life. Live for him. Live cognizant of the fact that he walks with you always. He's just always with us, directing our way. Live considering him. It's not only the brevity of life that he talks about in this passage, but he talks about the frailty of life. And the two go very close together. They're hand in hand almost. Verse 14 says, no one knows what your life will be like tomorrow. And I guess he means no one knows what sort of life you might have tomorrow. The arrogant statements of the businessmen that we read about in James chapter 4 that they will go somewhere when they wish, that they will stay as long as they wish, that they will make the money that they plan to and prosper. It brings on this comment from James. No one knows what your life will be like tomorrow. No one knows if you will be alive tomorrow. Life is frail. It's the presumption of these businessmen that they could determine their future that the fact that these plans move on an entirely earthly plane in which the primary value is financial profit, is, is that's what bothers James. Not that they would do business, not that they would make money, but they just didn't consider God. They didn't take him into account. They didn't honor him or glorify him. Listen to the contrast in verses 15, 13 and 15 of two people who had totally different outlooks on life. Verse 13, today or tomorrow, I shall go to this city or that city. I shall spend a year and I shall trade and I shall make profit. What's the pronoun that was repeated? I, I, I. Isn't that right? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Four times at least. Maybe it was more than that, but at least four times. They talked about I. Now listen to the contrast. Verse 15. If the Lord wills and we shall live, we shall do this or that. Wow, the contrast is obvious, isn't it? One person, they only considered themselves, and they considered themselves able to determine their own fate. And the other says, God is in control. God is directing my life. And they consider him in all things. In verse 15 where it says, if the Lord wills, we shall live. Is, is James telling us that when we talk about the future, we always have to preface it with that little phrase, if the Lord wills? Is he telling us that you can't talk about tomorrow unless you say, if the Lord wills? I don't think so. There's no magical phrases like this. I think what he's concerned about is the attitude of our heart. Inwardly, are we considering God and delighting in his providence? Or are we leaving him out and only planning for the future based on human resources, based on what we can do and say? How do we look at the future? Is our attitude, I'm going to go and do this and this and that and another thing? Or are plans formed with a desire to conform to what God wants in our lives? Are we praying, Lord, cause my heart to desire what you love. Lord, enable my heart to delight in your good pleasure. Do we play, pray like that? Are we basing our plans on what we believe God wants for us and what has already been revealed to us in his holy word? See, much of life can be lived just by the principles of scripture. They're already revealed to us. 
Too many times, I believe, we say, I want to find the will of God, when in fact we already should know it because it is revealed in his scripture. And if we know the principles of this word, there really aren't too many situations where we honestly don't know God's will. Well, in life, the hard part is is not being willing to submit our plans to God for his approval. It's in having the right attitude when they come back to us with the marks of God's providence all over them. A few years ago when we built our church in Santa Maria, we hired an architect, of course, and we got in cons- consultation with him and we worked out the plan and the, what we wanted where and what we wanted included and how it was going to be. And then the architect went back and put all of his magic markers together and, and drew the plans all out. And then we had to submit them to the city, right, to the plan checker. And when he got those plans back, there were red marks all over them. He was so confident bringing that plan to the city that he had it perfect and there wasn't going to be any problem with it. And he was so disappointed, the architect was so disappointed when he got them back with red marks here, there, and all over it. All those red marks says, you got to change this, you can't do that all over that plan. What about us? When we come with our plans for life and God puts the red marks of his providence all over our plans and says, you can't do this, I want you to go here instead. I want you to live like that. How do we react? What do we do? Do we push on forward with our original plans or do we fall on our face figuratively before the all-wise God and thank him for straightening out our crooked paths, for correcting our mistakes and setting us on the right way? You see, that's what God is doing when he changes our plans. He is telling us, this is not the way you should go. This is not for your spiritual good, but this is. How do we react when God does that? As much as anything else in life, our attitude in the face of frustrated plans and crushed dreams tells us whether or not we are living life for ourselves or living it to the glory of God. Think about that, really. When our plans are crushed, when we pray for one thing and it doesn't happen and another thing happens, when God answers in a different way, when God stops us and sends us a different direction, how we react to the providential leading of God and his hand in our life, that tells an awful lot about whether we're living for him or for ourselves. In verse 15, there is a crucial if It says, if the Lord wills. This isn't the if of doubt or concern or fear. In other words, he's not saying, does the Lord really have a will? If the Lord has a will. No, he's not saying that. It's the if of assurance that says God will stop his children from going the wrong way. And he will frustrate our plans when they are not good. And the person who plans with God rejoices, literally rejoices in the assurance that the expert planner is at work in our life. That God is all wise and he sees the future and he knows what is good for our spiritual life and for our eternal life as well. And we live with confidence knowing that God will direct our paths He will guide our way. Well, the person who plans with God rejoices in that assurance. It gives us great confidence. You young people know what this is like in your relationship with uh, your parents. Let's say, uh, and this is usually boys that do this, uh, 
let's say uh, you want to go set off some fireworks that were left over from the 4th of July. A friend of yours invites you, and you're going to blow things up and have a lot of fun setting up fireworks, setting off fireworks, because boys like to blow everything up that they can. That's our goal in life anyway. So you go to your parents, and you say, hey, I want to go over to my friend's house. We're going to have some fun with his leftover fireworks, firecrackers, and all of the rest, M15s. And, <laughs> and is it OK if I go? And your parents say, no. No, I, I don't want you to go. But your parents say, well, you say to your parents, Dad, Mom, you always spoil my fun. You don't let me do anything. Maybe some of you parents have heard that. Maybe some of your kids have said it. But you know the truth? Your parents don't want to spoil anything. Your parents love you and want to protect you and keep you out of trouble and keep you from getting hurt. And how do you handle that, young people? What kind of an attitude do you get? Can you possibly hear yourself saying, thanks, Mom, thanks, Dad. I know that you love me, and I know that you don't want me to get into trouble, and I know that you want to protect me, and so I want to thank you because you know better than I do. You've got more years of experience, and, and I want to thank you for guiding me and keeping me on the right path. How do you handle that? Kid, that's what God wants you to say. I have no doubt about that. He wants you to respect and love and affirm your mom and your dad. He wants to remind you that they love you, and he wants to encourage them to continue guiding you into Christ's mold. But dads and moms, what's your attitude when a really wise God and a loving Heavenly Father changes your plans? Huh? What happens when he says no to something you want to do? What happens when your business doesn't make money that you expect it to? What happens when a job falls through and things don't turn out the way you plan? How do you respond to that? Parents, if our children don't react right in situations like that, maybe it's because we haven't taught them by reacting with praise and thanksgiving and falling before God in worship when he changes our plans and directs us a different way than we really wanted to go. There is nothing in life more comforting than knowing that God will destroy the works of the flesh but he will prosper the works of the Spirit. He directs our paths along a good way. It's a song we sang, the 23rd Psalm. He directs us into the right paths, the right way. Well, since your life is so uncertain and hangs by a slender thread, since you cannot control its continuation or its termination, not even beyond doubt, even for the next moment, it is arrogant and boastful pride to plan like these Jewish businessmen planned in James chapter 4. We cannot plan that way. You see, the only certainties in life are those that have to do with God's faithfulness. God is always faithful and he's always true. Anything that pertains to the character of God is unchangeable and is totally dependable. So why then would we not want to take God into consideration in the making of our plans? Why, O oh Christian, do we not welcome God's strong and loving intervention into the weaknesses and frailty of the few years that we have here on this earth? Scripture forbids us undue confidence or boasting in our own plans and accomplishments. And it requires us to have the confidence in Christ that he will direct and limit and expand our designs for the future based on nothing but his own will, his wise will. And all things are to be done with the heart's desire 
that they coincide with the good and perfect will of God for our lives. Live daily with the full confidence that God walks with us, that God is always with us. Whether you recognize it moment by moment or not doesn't change the fact. Our God, our good and gracious God, is always relevant in every aspect of our life. Perhaps there might be some here today that are living in either the foolish confidence that you're in control of your own life or the fearful concern that your life may fall apart at any moment. That you have never trusted Jesus, never leaned upon his strength, never heard his voice of compassion, never known his forgiveness for all the wrong things in your life. Your life is nothing more than your own plans and dreams and you've never given thought to God. And all you will have is dreams unfulfilled and plans unutilized, realized and pleasures that will fade and a view of eternity that's filled with uncertainty and fear. And if that's your state today, I invite you, based on the words of Scripture, to come to Jesus, to trust him, to see that he is the wise planner, the one whose providence is sovereign and directs our lives along the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And so we invite you, if that's your state, to come and trust Jesus. And the rest of you who have faith in Christ and are trying to live for him, just remind you that, that in everything we do and everything that we plan, we have to consider the will of our Heavenly Father because you can trust him. You can trust him absolutely with everything in your life, with everything you do. And pray that our hearts will desire what God wills. That should be our prayer. Lord, I would like this to happen in my life, but above that, Lord, I want to pray that I will love what you want for me and what you have for me. That's considering God every day of our life, living, knowing his presence. What a comforting thought. He walks with us every single moment of every single day. Wherever we go, whatever we do, he is relevant. He is real. He is present. Lord, we don't even pretend to claim that, that we have wisdom that matches yours or that comes anywhere near yours. You are infinite and eternal in all things, all of your perfections are perfect and know no end. Your grace is never exhausted. There is always a full reservoir. Even when it's poured out in lavish terms upon us, your grace never diminishes. And so, Lord, it gives us confidence to live our life on this earth, dependent upon your goodness and your grace and your provision. And we want to pause and recognize that we are completely dependent upon you for all things, not only all things in this life, but for the next life as well. Lord Jesus, as you lead us along this path toward our glorious heavenly home, I ask that you help us be more willing to submit to your will each day, to learn as life goes on that it is a brief period of time, that it is a very frail, fragile life that we live. And therefore, we must depend upon you. We must have your blessing. We must have your provision. God, you are so great that we are your grateful children. Amen.
Completely 